Welcome everyone. My name is Erin Shoemaker. I'm a senior healthy living editor at the Huffington Post and I'm also today's moderator. Today we're talking about hormone altering chemicals with a focus on how those chemicals affect fertility as well as male and female reproductive health. Today's event is presented jointly with the Huffington Post and is part of the Andalou series on current science controversies. We're live streaming the event on the forum and Huffington Post websites and we're also streaming it on Facebook. Our panelists, starting from my immediate right, are Russ Hauser, acting chair of the Department of Environmental Health at the Harvard Chan School. We have Tamara James Todd, assistant professor of environmental, reproductive, and perinatal epidemiology at the Harvard Chan School. Nika Leiba, deputy director of research at the Environmental Working Group. And then joining us remotely, we have Pete Myers, founder, <coughs> CEO, and chief scientist <coughs> at Environmental Health Sciences. Our program will include a brief Q&A, and you can email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat that's happening on the forum website right now. Russ, if you want to start us off, what are some of the big concerns here? Sure, thank, thank you very much. And um, happy to be here. I, I think what I would do in, in terms of kind of setting up uh, the forum is just talk a little bit about what endocrine disruptors are, what the endocrine system is, and some of the health outcomes that may be related to endocrine disruptors, and then why are we potentially concerned about human exposure to endocrine disruptors. So first of all, endocrine disruptors are chemicals that interfere with the nor normal hormonal system, uh, normal hormonal action in the endocrine system. So some um, um, endocrine disruptors can mimic hormones, they can block the action of hormones, and there are even some uh, chemicals that may alter the metabolism of our, of our normal endogenous hormones. So the endocrine system is important for many different reasons. It's very important in terms of growth and development, and so the, it has functions both during uh, fetal development, development in, children's, all the, in children, all the way to adulthood. It's important for reproduction, so um, in relation to male and female fertility, which is the topic of, of today's forum. It's important in immune function, uh, metabolic health, which has relationships to obesity, diabetes. So endocrine disruptors are considered to be chemicals. There are synthetic endocrine disruptor chemicals that are um, uh, man-made. And then there is also natural compounds that are endocrine disruptors. And there's broad classes of um, endocrine disruptors. Some of the endocrine disruptors are persistent chemicals. So what this, that means is that they have long biological half life So when they get into us, they may last for months or years. And then there are other endocrine disruptors that have very short half-lives. So some of the endocrine disruptors with very long half-lives include dioxins, furans, PCBs, which are polychlorinated biphenyls. <clears throat> There's also... Um, long-lived flame retardants, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, which have half-lives of, of months to years as well. There are also endocrine disruptors that have short half-lives, <coughs> excuse me, and these are uh, considered non-persistent chemicals, and these include chemicals such as phthalates, uh, bisphenol A, uh, and some pesticides. There are also flame retardants that are short-lived, and these are the uh, phosphate uh, flame retardants, and by short-lived, I mean they have half-lives of hours in our body. So why are we concerned with human um, exposure to endocrine disruptors and effects on health? We know that there's literally tens of thousands of chemicals in commerce. Numbers thrown around include approximately 80,000. Most of these chemicals have not been tested for effects on human health. Very few of them have been very well studied and even fewer have been studied in relation to effects on the endocrine system. These chemicals to which we're exposed, there's literally many hundreds that are present in our everyday products, which leads to widespread, ubiquitous, general population exposure. So some of these endocrine disrupting chemicals are found in our cosmetics, our personal care products, they're found, uh, or they're used in uh, food packaging and processing materials, building products. They're also used in uh, medications as well as medical devices. So what this means is that there's very widespread general population uh, exposure 
to literally hundreds of chemicals that may have endocrine disrupting properties. And the widespread general population exposure is to adult men, women, pregnant women, and children. So really all segments of the population are exposed to endocrine disruptors. As I mentioned in the beginning, they can cause uh, a variety of health effects. Today we're focusing on reproductive effects, but they can affect the immune system, m metabolism, development, uh, et cetera. And then I'll just close with one of the final points is that even though there is general population exposure to these chemicals, our exposure is at very low levels. But there is data suggesting that low dose exposure to some of these chemicals can have uh, effects in humans. And we'll be talking, I think, more about this as the forum progresses. Thanks, Russ. So. Tamir, I'd love if you could follow up on this. Uh, research shows that these chemicals can cause prenatal impacts, and your research in particular uh, examines how those chemicals affect pregnant women and some health disparities that play up. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So um, we've been really focusing in on um, pregnancy health and thinking about how endocrine disrupting chemicals um, can somehow impact not only child health, which has been somewhat of a focus um, in more recent years, but also the pregnant woman. So um, just to kind of take a step back, about 25% of pregnancies, so a quarter of pregnancies, have some sort of complication. And so that's not trivial. So when you're thinking about that, you're thinking about preterm birth, gestational diabetes, um, intrauterine growth restriction, preeclampsia. And so there's been an increasing body of research around the fact that really there might not only be kind of underlying genetic factors that are related to this, but that endocrine disruptors as an environmental factor could also be related to um, many of these pregnancy complications. So one of the uh, projects that we've been really focusing in on um, using uh, data from two uh, large ongoing uh, cohort studies has focused in on uh, the non-persistent chemicals that um, Russ just mentioned. So looking at a particular class of chemicals known as phthalates. And these are plasticizers commonly used um, in cosmetics for some of the kind of lower molecular weight uh, phthalate um, metabolites and compounds, and then others that are used in food packaging and industrial products. And so what we've been finding um, is, is a number of associations that are related to glucose dysregulation. So pregnancy is an increasingly um, insulin resistant state. And oftentimes um, women um, may, who, who do not have the ability to kind of overcome this increasing insulin resistant state uh, may go on to develop some sort of impairment in glucose tolerance. And about, in the US, about 7% of these women will go on to be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Um, the, the question is whether or not um, these chemicals have been associated with um, increasing glucose um, levels. And, and we do see some suggestion that um, higher concentrations for some of, uh, of the phthalates um, actually um, are associated with higher glucose levels. Um, there's another body of research that has, has found that uh, phthalates, the same um, compounds, are associated with preterm birth, uh, preeclampsia, um, and, and kind of a number of other um, adverse pregnancy complications. The implications of this are not just relevant to just pregnancy, but what we now know is that uh, many of these complications are often a signal of future development of chronic disease risk. So women, for example, who do develop gestational diabetes um, are also at increased risk of going on to develop type 2 diabetes down the line. And so it's really important to think about um, these chemical exposures in the context, not only in pregnancy health, but what does this say or suggest uh, for, a, for future uh, disease risk? Um, it is also um, known that many of these pregnancy complications um, are associated with adverse child health outcomes. So again, going back and thinking about that in the context of how uh, complications during uh, pregnancy can impact um, health. The other thing that we've been focusing on is really thinking about populations that are vulnerable, um, who may have higher exposure to many of these chemicals. So um, what we've been focusing in on, and many others as well, is thinking about um, are there certain groups of, of, of people um, that may have higher concentrations of these chemicals. Uh, we've, again, been focusing primarily on pregnancy, and what we've found is um, that, in fact, uh, non-Hispanic black and Hispanic women um, ha often have higher concentrations of many of um, the non-persistent chemicals um, that, that Russ mentioned. And again, focusing 
ex kind of exclusively on uh, phthalates and um, some of the other non-persistent chemicals, we have found that while there are changes across pregnancy, because again, they are non-persistent, um, across the whole entire time period of pregnancy, many of these chemicals um, maintain a higher um, uh, concentrations for, for these uh, vulnerable groups of women. The relevance of which, uh, preterm birth, for example, um, black women are, have a prevalence of preterm birth that's twice as high as white women. Um, with respect to uh, gestational diabetes, again, um, non-white uh, populations have a much higher prevalence of these conditions. So in thinking about what are the implications of higher uh, burdens of these of exposure to these um, um, endocrine disruptors, we really have to think about what um, the chemical exposures um, may, you know, have with respect to disparate um, outcomes related not only to these pregnancy complications, but also down the line to many of the chronic conditions that um, are developed. Thanks so much, Tamara. So as we just heard, personal care products uh, can be a source of exposure uh, to these chemicals, and teens are actually especially vulnerable because on average they use more products than adults do. Let's take a look at a clip now from the Environmental Working Group. No, honestly, no. 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 Maybe just like good smelling stuff. <laughs> no. No, I have no idea. Well, I think it's stunning that over 10,000 ingredients haven't really been approved by the FDA. It kind of scares me that a bunch of these things are really dangerous. Well, now that I know that chemicals I'm putting on my body are illegal in other countries, it worries me a lot that they're legal here. And um, some of this information makes me feel like I can't trust um, what I read on labels anymore. Nika, so as the video showed, the Environmental Working Group has raised concerns about these issues. What have you found, uh, and can we talk about personal care products first? Certainly, yeah, I think um, the, the opening of that video is how many personal care products do we use every day? And I don't think most of us know the answer to that, or how many chemicals we're exposed to through the use of those personal care products. So it's a really interesting question. Um, and the impetus for that video was a biomonitoring study that EWG conducted a few years ago where we tested the blood and urine of teenage girls for um, 25 commonly used personal care product ingredients, some of the ones that both um, Tamara and Russ had mentioned, including phthalates. Um, we chose teenage girls because on average, they use more personal care products than, than adults, which should not be shocking to any of us who were ever teenage girls. Um, whereas the average adult uses between 10 and 12 personal care products each day, including men, um, the average teenage girl uses about 17 personal care products each day, exposing herself to roughly, or an average of 180 unique chemicals just through personal care products. So we tested for 25 chemicals in 20 teenage girls and we found 16. And unfortunately, all 16 of these chemicals had been associated with endocrine disruption. This was shocking, but more concerning to us because teenagers may be more sensitive to endocrine disrupting chemicals. When you think about it, teenagers are going through a period of adolescence. And what's going on during adolescence? During adolescence, there is complex hormonal signaling that guides the development of all of our systems, reproductive system, brain, bone, immune <coughs> system. So when you have chemicals that could potentially affect that hormone s signaling, that is concerning. Um, but although we focused on teenagers for that video and for that study, we know that we're all exposed. We're all exposed and we're all exposed every day. And we're not exposed just through personal care products. Russ mentioned quite a number of other exposures and they're ubiquitous every single day. So as was mentioned, there's phthalates, parabens, triclosan, 
in personal care products um, that have been associated, those ingredients have been associated with endocrine disruption. And then in food, you have uh, propylparaben and BHA, for example. Food packaging, we all have heard about bisphenol A, and now who, who knows about bisphenol S? Not sure, right? In water, we've found atrazine and perchlorate. Again, both have been associated with endocrine disruption. Uh, Russ mentioned that our couches may be covered or treated with flame retardants that are associated with endocrine disruption. Um, PFCs or uh, poly or per fluorinated chemicals cover or non-stick cookware and or waterproof clothing. I mean, the exposures, again, I can't say this enough, are ubiquitous. So in order to tackle this issue and other environmental health related issues, the Environmental Working Group, um, the nonprofit research and advocacy organization that I work for, we take a multiple pronged approach. So on one hand, we push, well, this is going to be three hands because it's three approaches, but um, on one hand, we push for uh, more health protective policies. Um, on the other hand, we educate consumers about the issue, about endocrine disruptors and other chemicals of concern that they're exposed to while offering solutions where solutions exist. Because I, I won't kid you, sometimes there's not a ready solution, but when there's a ready solution, we'll offer it. And on the third hand, we, um, we push for market change. Um, participating in forums like this is a really important part of our approach as well because it's crucial that we have open dialogue about what the issues are, really delve into the science, and then as a group we discuss possible solutions. Thanks so much, Nika. So we have Pete joining us remotely. Pete, what's your perspective as scientist and CEO? Well, first of all, thank you for letting me come in from Europe for this <laughs> event. No, uh, thank it's you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I would like to begin, and I'm going to take a somewhat 30,000-foot uh, view of all this. I've been working on endocrine disruptions since the 1980s, and I've seen some big trends unfold. Um, so the Andalus series is on current scientific controversies. So in, in science, there are debates. There are legitimate scientific agreements about many details of endocrine disruption. But the World Health Organization has concluded just within the last few years that EDCs are a global public health threat. That's not controversial, at least within the scientific community. The lead scientific medical association working on endocrine disruption is the Endocrine Society. 18,000 endocrine ologists around the world, 70% uh, of whom are physicians. The Endocrine Society has said this is their major, one of their major public health issues. It only becomes a controversy when it enters the domain of regulation and stakeholders get involved in attempting to protect their products from regulators that would limit their use. This, then it becomes a manufactured controversy. So I've been, uh, as I said, I've been involved in this for a long time. At the beginning, everyone's focus was largely on androgens and estrogens, things hacking those hormone systems. But as we've heard hints, um, over these 25, 30 years, the, the range of possible systems being affected has expanded greatly. One of the biggest surprises has been the emergence of what are called obesogens and metabolic disruptors that lead to obesity and um, interference with insulin regulation and type 2 diabetes. It's a very interesting scientific story that perhaps we could return to as the talk, as the event goes on. But that is just the beginning. If you think about it, virtually all hormonal systems are potentially vulnerable to disruption because of their nature. They involve sending molecules through the body uh, whose effects take place at very low doses. And um, we've generated a lot of chemicals over the last 80 years, some of whom by accident interfere with hormones. We just haven't had the chance to study all of them. So expect more news about additional systems being affected as this unfolds. The work in science has, and, and work of organizations like EWG has developed significant public awareness that is driving markets. Go to any drugstore and you're gonna see bottles labeled bisphenol A free, not just in the US, but literally around the world. This has been a great achievement, but it's also created something of a problem that we didn't anticipate. And that's a subject called regrettable substitutions. Uh, Nika referred to one of those, or perhaps it was Tara, and talking about BPS. 
what manufacturers have learned is they can label things BPA free by only making subtle changes in the molecules, substituting one uh, attachment group to another or to or another, so that the, you get something that really isn't BPA, but it has the same to toxicological problems of BPA. So we, this is really an important uh, point that we need to work on. As you step back and look at the key issues in endocrine disruption science, I, I would summarize them with four points, some of which have already been said. Low doses matter a lot. Hormones work at low doses. Endocrine disrupting compounds work at low doses also, really low doses, parts per billion. Second, the traditional tests used to ask, is this chemical safe? Assume that high dose testing works to, re re to reveal low dose impacts. Well, it, that may be, that may work for traditional toxins, uh, but for hormones, it doesn't work. And for endocrine disrupting compounds, it doesn't work. Things can happen at low doses that are literally invisible to typical high dose testing. And we can return to this later. Third, again, we've heard reference to this. What starts in the womb does not end in the womb. Fetal events can play out over the lifetime of the exposed individual. And now we're seeing data, strong data, multiple studies saying that they can not only play out over the lifetime of the indivi individual, but over generations, a whole new field called transgenerational epigenetic effects. And finally, as everyone has mentioned, exposure is ubiquitous. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. So mm -hmm. let's take another look at how ubiquitous these chemicals can be. Uh, this video is from the Environmental Defense Fund. That clip touched on action consumers can take and highlights the Environmental Defense Fund's resources. Nika, your organization, the uh, Environmental Working Group, has programs geared to help consumers. Um, can you tell us a little about them? Yeah, as I mentioned before, one of um, the approaches that we, we take at EWG is to provide solutions. And we have, over the years, um, EWG is more than 20 years old, but we have a number of databases or searchable resources where you can look for personal care products um, that don't have ingredients that have been linked to adverse health impacts. That's our Skin Deep database. So in that database, we have about 70,000 personal care products, and all of them are rated based on the presence of um, ingredients that have been linked to adverse health impacts, like I said. We have a similar database for cleaning products, household cleaning products, um, the Healthy Home uh, Guide, and we have something similar for food. And that's just a small mm -hmm. selection of some of the things we have, but there are resources out there that can help with certain um, product types. As I said, though, there are things that we can't necessarily have an easy solution for. Um, air quality, you know, sometimes it's, it, you're going to breathe the air outside, you have to, or you still die, right? So you can't, avoid, well, most of us. Um, so there's some exposures that you just can't shop your way out of. Right. So while we can provide um, some really amazing resources, we do have to think of solutions that surpass that so that all of the chemicals that are, we're being exposed mm -hmm. to meet a certain level of safety. Absolutely. I mean, I'd love if you could kind of delve into that a little more. Like, how do you balance that consumer education with regulation? Because like you said, we can't just buy our way out of this. So I think we, we do both at the same time. Um, we have a government affairs team that pushes for stronger regulation of, of chemicals um, in the, our environment. Regulation moves slowly, um, sometimes more slowly than other times. 
And so while pushing for stricter regulations, we're also educating the consumer. What we've seen is that that consumer education is sometimes very, very powerful. We've seen the markets move in. As Pete said, you are now seeing products that say phthalate free, BPA free, and that's because the markets are responding to what we're asking for. And so what we advise um, consumers to do is become em empowered by being informed and making purchasing decisions based on, on th this new knowledge. Mm -hmm. Pete, is that something you could speak to? Why has regulation moved so slowly? What's going on? Well, there are many reasons why regulation has advanced very slowly. Um, the big one is money. There's a lot of money at stake. Um, if if regulators to, work, to act on the science we have in hand now, it would require multiple products be, to be taken off the marketplace. And there are games that people play to try and make that not happen. Bisphenol A, for example, uh, last estimate I saw from a few years ago is worth about seven hundred thousand dollars an hour, an hour in revenue. That pays for a lot of lawyers. It play, pays for a lot of misrepresentation. And if we had agencies that were immune to those types of pressures, well, I think they would act on the science. But they're not for multiple reasons, uh, having to do with um, the revolving door. Um, one FDA employee uh, that I debated with several years ago, uh, who claimed that non-monotonicity, this low-dose effect being different from high-dose effects, now is making uh, serious money as a, an employee of one of the lead law firms that manufactures doubt about chemical products. So we face a system that makes the movement of science into regulation move very slowly and sometimes move backwards. Mm -hmm. And I know there was a big uh, change last year to the Toxic Control Substance Act. Could you, uh, Nika, maybe explain a little bit about uh, what that is and how it changed? Yeah, the um, Toxic Substances Control Act is one of the major federal statutes that governs um, thousands of chemicals that we're exposed to um, every, every day. It was introduced um, in the 1970s and it was reauthorized last year. Um, uh, President uh, Obama signed it in 2016. The old TOSCA pre-reauthorization was a dinosaur in terms of it did not allow or it, it, didn't, it did not give the EPA ability to ensure that products were tested and safe before they hit the market. Um, as many have said, that means that we are in fact the guinea pigs so that the chemicals are being tested on us as we use the products. And um, I think you had mentioned this, Erin, nobody wants to be called a guinea pig. No. <laughs> um, but the, the reauthorization gives the EPA some more oversight and um, more powerful tools to monitor uh, chemicals. Um, they now have to do systematic review of chemicals in commerce um, and ensure or check to see if these chemicals meet a safety standard. And if they don't, they're supposed to uh, limit their use. Obviously, there are loopholes and inherent um, questions within this, how many chemicals and, you know, there are ways to slow this process down. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it was reauthorized does give us a little bit of hope that some of the chemicals that we're routinely exposed to will be will be tested. Yeah, I mean, that sounds very encouraging. Um, it also happened under Obama. What do we think about, uh, and this could be for you, Nika, or for you, Pete, what do we think about the changing administration and some of the deregulation that's going on? What, what could happen? You know, well, uh, go ahead, Pete. Go ahead, Nika. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> totally answer at once. <laughs> um, so I think that it's interesting. I'm, I'm interested to hear what Pete has to say as well. We don't know necessarily what's going to happen with the new administration. Some of the nominees, though, that have been tapped, such as Scott Pruitt, who has been tapped as the EPA um, administrator, concern us. He has taken some actions, especially when he was the um, attorney general of Oklahoma, that weren't necessarily protective of the environment. Um, while he was the attorney general of Oklahoma, he uh, participated in lawsuits against the EPA to block their um, air standards for reducing mercury emissions. 
Um, when he was in the AG's office, for example, he also banned their or, or put a stop to their environmental protection unit, taking the budget down to zero. And so there are a lot of things that make us particularly concerned about some of the nominees. But we also like to think that our issues, especially when it comes to public health, is a bipartisan issue. Everybody mm -hmm. wants clean air. Everybody wants clean water. So we'll continue to push for those things. But at this time, we also think <clears throat> it's more now than ever that consumers take that role. You know, I think right. the government has in the past done that game where it's like, not me, <laughs> you know, and now the industry is saying, not me. Well, it, now it's us. So we have to become ed educated about these mm -hmm. issues and make educated decisions yeah. um, until something else happens. Right. I'd love if you could jump in here, Russ. Sure. What are some of these, uh, what are some resources for everyday people to use who are, you know, concerned about either their reproductive health or fertility or just, you know, chemicals? Well, I, I, I can answer that. And then I, I was taking a few notes. I wanted to, oh, well, to add a little bit to <laughs> what others were, were saying. So, I mean, I, I uh, agree that, um, you know, what EWG publishes in terms of listing products that may have specific chemicals in it that may be endocrine disruptors is helpful. The difficulty there, though, is you're putting the burden on the consumer. Mm -hmm. The other thing is products are continually changing. So they may, you know, this year or this month, they may have a certain chemical in the product, and then six months later, they may remove that chemical, and that may have to do with, you know, economics, et cetera. So when you look at the e EWG website, you know, you may say, well, these chemical or these products may not have these chemicals, you're not sure six months or even uh, a year later. So I, you know, I, I think, which I think all of us agree, that um, there needs to be better testing mm -hmm. and it really needs to, to come from um, you know, the, the federal government that the burden should not be put on individuals. And I think you know, playing um, or adding to what Pete was saying as, as well as um, others in terms of um, testing and thinking about endocrine disruptors, is I think it's it's a societal question, you know, in terms of protecting health. Um, when I started doing research um, on endocrine disruptors, probably about 20 years ago, um, it was in a sense a new frontier to study consumer products. Environmental health it focused a lot on what's in our air, what's in our water, and I think over the last 20 years, and I think Pete would agree, with the public and the scientists have become much more aware of all of the chemicals that are in the products that we put on our bodies every day and that these chemicals are really not tested. And by analogy, if you think about a company developing a new medication, it undergoes exquisite testing for safety before people take the medication, which is almost the opposite of what happens when a new chemical is developed in terms of minimal testing and then there's potentially ubiquitous exposure at all life stages, you know, basically pregnant women mm -hmm. and children, which would be more sensitive to the chemicals. And then the last thing I wanted to add, which is not directly relevant to the exact question you, you asked, is something that wasn't mentioned yet is mixtures. So we're talking about literally hundreds of different chemicals that we can probably measure in all of our bodies. These chemicals do not act independently. They may act together synergistically, antagonistically. They may act additively. So in someone's body, if you're measuring hundreds of chemicals, the way we need to assess risk is not to think about them a single chemical at a time, but think about the mixture mm -hmm. to which we're all exposed and to come up with um, regulations that can protect human health based on exposures to mixtures rather than individual chemicals one at a time. Absolutely. Just to kind of follow up on that, uh, not everyone is at the same risk. Maybe, Tamara, you can tell us a little bit about some of the health disparities that uh, exist between different groups and what that means. Sure, sure. So um, to kind of pick up on Russ's point of mixtures and a little bit about what we spoke about earlier in the Facebook Live, uh, feed, but this idea of um, there are populations that are more vulnerable, um, be it due to their furniture quality or housing quality, um, so that they're more exposed to flame retardants, or populations that uh, just due to diet, um, they're exposed more to 
um, you know, certain um, phenols, um, as well as populations that, due to cultural practices, uh, may um, you know, use certain fragrances more um, and are, you know, co cosmetics um, uses different um, across populations. And so um, how that uh, tracks together and carries together may really give people different risk profiles um, and the implications of which, again, going back to um, some of the points earlier, really have impact not only during the reproductive period, but also across um, the lifespan. And really thinking about repeated exposures, exposures that are both persistent, but as well as those that are non-persistent, um, that you know just use daily um, and exposure daily to, to, to these products have um, real implications. So for example, um, um, there's data from uh, the, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is a survey uh, conducted by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. And um, when you look at some of the data from that, which represents um, a representative population from the United States, you see that, for example, for um, uh, phthalates, um, that you, you, you see that again, going back to uh, racial ethnic differences, that non-Hispanic uh, blacks and whites, as well as women, have um, non-Hispanic blacks and Hispanics have um, higher uh, concentrations of many of these phthalates. There's some um, studies that also suggest that with respect to the phenols, parabens, um, as well as bisphenol A, and um, Hispanics particularly having higher levels of some of the flame retardants. Um, and you know, again, going back to um, not only during the reproductive time period, but across the lifespan, what are the implications? How can we reduce exposure? Um, is, is that um, going to be consumer driven? Is that going to be driven by uh, policymakers with respect to these vulnerable uh, populations, I think is, is also critical to add to this uh, discussion. Yeah, I'd, I'd love if you actually could even talk a little bit more about how to reduce exposure, especially for some of these vulnerable groups. Like what, what can they do to reduce their exposure? Um, I mean, going back to Russ's point, I do think that we need to have more, um, you know, regulation on, on, you know, the government level. Um, there may be some things that uh, consumers themselves could do, for example, uh, reducing their use of perfumes and uh, nail polishes as well as cosmetics, um, potentially using um, um, uh, bl blinds that are um, not the plastic blinds. Um, we, we have um, published on the School Public Health's website a nice little uh, chart that provides some additional uh, resources for, for that. And obviously, the Environmental Working Group has information um, with a recent uh, update uh, for um, including more products for, from women of color, um, um, specifically. And I, yeah, I just want to add that I completely agree, though, with Ross and Tamara. I, you can have all the best you know, solutions in order to have all populations, everyone um, protected, mm -hmm. we need an overarching uh, change, which is a, on a policy level. That's the only way to ensure that every demographic is, is um, held to the same level. Because with some of the solutions, there may be more cost prohibitive. Organic food, for example, may cost a little bit more, or biz, um, BPA-free cans may cost a little bit more, and so there are populations that can't afford that, mm -hmm. and that should not be a factor. We should all be held to the same uh, level of safety, and so that would require a policy change. Right. So that's the ultimate solution. Are there specific policy changes that you would like to see implemented? Um, uh, we would like to see the EPA um, have greater oversight over the, the chemicals that are used, but also the law that governs personal care products, for example, is in the FDA. And I'd mentioned before that the EPA TOSCA hadn't been updated since the 1970s, and we all went, ah, well, the, the law that governs personal care products hasn't been updated since the 1930s. So well, we are way behind um, in so many laws, and there's so many chemicals, as Russ mentioned, probably 80,000 chemicals that are out there um, and many of them have not been assessed for safety. About two years ago, I saw an EPA number that said only 2% had been assessed by the EPA. Um, so we need, we need some movement in, in that regard, and that's going to take, take a policy action. Right. Thank you, Nika. Could, could I give a specific example Absolutely. that I think is illustrative? Um, Alex, uh, Alexis Temkin and her co-authors, including Lou Gillette at the, the Medical School of South Carolina, did an analysis of the contents of the uh, dispersant that was used during the, the uh, big oil spill in the Gulf of 
of uh, Mexico uh, a few years ago. And they discovered that the main active ingredient in that dispersant called Corexit, that main axit, uh, active ingredient is actually a um, surfactant called dioctyl sodium sulfosic, I can't even say it, sulfosuccinate, uh, or DOS, which it turns out, if you use sophisticated testing, uh, is an obesogen, at least according to the data that they have. This has been on the market in common use for decades. Uh, it comes under the jurisdiction, not of the EPA, but of the FDA. And when Lexi presented this to a grand rounds at the medical school of South Carolina, several pediatricians put up their hands and said, wait a second, that's a, a, a really common laxative taken by most pregnant women in the U.S. Thank you, Pete. <laughs> we are going to move on to the question and answer uh, segment of the forum. Lisa, do we have some online questions? Yes, thanks, Erin. We have questions coming in, and I think we'll just be able to take a few. Uh, let's see. Let's start with this one. It's very disturbing to hear about substances like BPA being replaced by, B by BPS, which has its own harmful effects. This type of situation where a dangerous chemical is replaced by one with a similar molecular structure can only lead to further problems. It seems to me that much could be done by addressing just this one problem through new regulations that apply to a group of related substances where one dangerous chemical can't be substituted for another. What is the issue here? Is it the pharma companies, the lack of EPA regulation? What can consumers do to apply pressure in the right place? I'll give that one a go. Um, <laughs> regrettable yeah. substitution is what we call it. I think somebody mentioned that earlier, and it happens all the time. It has happened with flame retardants. It happened with BPA. Um, I think Pete actually spoke about it a little bit, where you take, break off one end of a chemical, slap on another one, and, and it's different. Um, and the only way to, to um, curb that issue is through policies requiring that the chemicals are tested before they go on the market, whether it be as a class system and, and, and um, looking at the class or the groups of chemicals. But regardless, they need to be tested prior to going on the market rather than after. Um, what can consumers do about this? Uh, you know, you need to pick up the phone and call your representative. You need to make your voice heard because the only way to, to put that pressure on the government is to voice your concerns to your representative. Otherwise, I'm not sure um, how else that can be, how else a consumer necessarily can, can help that along. And I, I would, if I could add to that. Oh, go ahead, Pete. Um, so there is another approach, and that's to help chemists make money by making safer materials and being honest about the consequences of those replacements. Uh, I, I participated in an effort that went over about six years of bringing together chemists from green chemistry and experts in endocrine disruption to design an intellectual framework that tried to develop just that approach. And um, it, we, we believe it was quite successful. We know enough science now to avoid endocrine disruption, pro endocrine disruption policies in new chemicals. And we also know that it's economically efficient in the long run for chemical companies to adopt this approach, test in their own laboratories as they're developing, as they're synthesizing the new molecules before they develop a, a big economic commitment to it, either um, stop using it if it looks like it's a problem or manipulate the molecular characteristics of it to avoid endocrine disruption. We know a lot now, we're not taking advantage of that. And the marketplace is ready to reward chemi chemical companies that follow that approach. And just, just to add quickly, I think a, another pressure point could be the companies themselves. Uh -huh. I mean, people, in terms of what they buy, where you know they do advertise now, phthalate free or BPA free, uh -huh. but letting companies know, you know, the the need f for this. And then a, a final point in re relation to the substitution is doing the science when a new chemical is put on the market, it can take us 5, 10, 15 years to really understand potential the health risks from that chemical. So it's not you know, something that we understand within months or even a year or two. 
So once that chemical is introduced into the market, you have, again, that widespread exposure. And it takes science a long time to, to catch up to really understand. So if you do, similar to what um, Pete was saying, you know, in, in terms of when you're developing the chemical, before you're introducing it is to ask these questions. Right, yeah, I think that's a very important point. Yeah. Do you have another question? Great, thank you, everyone. Um, this is from our live chat. One quarter of pregnancies have a problem. Did I hear this correctly? This seems remarkably high. Can you tell us more about this? What was the problem rate 20 years ago? Right. Um, so that has been increasing over time. Um, and so um, data from a number of sources, at least here in the US, have um, been showing that you know that quarter um, of the, the pregnant population is a pretty robust number now. That certainly was not the case. I mean, you think about something like gestational diabetes where, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago it was more like 3% of the population. Now, depending on the population you're looking at, um, even here within the U.S., it, um, overall it's 7%, but it can be as high as 14% in some populations. And that's alarming. Um, you know, it's not something, you know, oftentimes it's said, oh, maybe there's something um, attributed to genetics. This is not something that is genetic. Um, this is something that certainly is environmental, and it's a possibility that um, certainly these chemical exposures, um, as, as a number of folks mentioned, um, known to be obesogens, known to be uh, metabolic dis dis uh, regulators, um, that they really may have some influence on um, th some of these pregnancy complications. If I could add to that, um, it's not just the problem, the problems that take place during pregnancy. It's also challenges to becoming pregnant. A recent study came out of China, brilliant study, huge sample size, showing that over 15 years, the percentage of men qualifying as sperm count donors declined from about 50 percent to 20 percent in just 15 years. Uh, that's a problem in fertility. And it's actually predicted by a robust literature coming out of many different laboratories, including Russ's, that link sperm problems with endocrine disrupting chemicals. Thank you. Now, if we have any questions in the audience, we have time for a question or two. Uh, what are you wondering about? I think I see one in the middle. Um. Yeah, I just had a comment that a lot of the conversation have been towards consumers. Can you touch on workers and how we can develop regulations or other policies to uh, remove toxic substances in the workplace? Is that something you might want to touch on, Nika? Uh, you know, I can't speak a lot to it. I do know, and I'm very thankful that you brought that up, because workers are often exposed at much higher doses um, and have um, much more of a chemical body burden due to, to occupational exposures. It's not something we necessarily look at ad nauseum. But for example, when you think of pesticides, and a lot of pesticides have been uh, linked to endocrine disruption, and we think of, oh, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables or home use, when you think that there are people that are applying pesticides on a daily basis, it's definitely a, a concern. And one of the things that we advocate for is that when laws are passed that vulnerable populations are taken into account and they look for safe levels for vulnerable populations and in a lot of these cases workers would classify as a vulnerable group. Thank you. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health just published a really troubling study about workers employed in manufacturing facilities that uh, use BPA. The levels that they reported are astoundingly high well within the range uh, of a comparable study done in China where they found uh, levels linked to a variety of effects on the libido, on erectile dysfunction, and other problems in men. Um, unfortunately, the NIOSH study, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, did not look at the health consequences. But when you look at the numbers they reported, uh, it would be really unlikely that the guys working in these plants in the U.S. are not being affected. And just one more thing to add there. We also, as Pete mentioned that example, I thought about um, salon workers mm -hmm. and um, hair care workers. I know when the formaldehyde laced um, hair, straightening, hair straightening treatments, the keratin treatments, those are 
a high, high, high um, percentage of formaldehyde, which is uh, inhalable carcinogen. Um, those workers were having effects and some were fainting, some couldn't uh, work for, some of the um, hairdressers could not work for the full day, but also nail salon workers are also um, getting effects from their exposures. And you think about, it's not only that they're being exposed all day long, but a lot of times they're in enclosed areas. Um, so their exposure is concentrated in a way. So definitely a concern and a very good question. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So we're going to wrap up here, and I'm asking each panelist to uh, clearly identify a policy takeaway on the subject. Russ, would you start us off? A single policy takeaway? Uh, or multiple, if you've got multiple. them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, my takeaway really would be that um, I, I think that there's a lot of public awareness now and a lot of scientific data that has come out and I, I really think at the, the at the federal level or state level that there, there really needs to be changes in the way we regulate the chemicals that are on the market and especially the new chemicals that are introduced to the market and we can model this you know maybe not as strictly as when you develop a pharmaceutical but new pesticides that come on the market before they're registered undergo a lot of testing. And for some reason, um, historically really, the chemicals that are in what we call kind of our everyday products really are not subject to this type of scrutiny and testing that is you know, really needed to protect public health. Thank you. Tamara? Um, I, I go back to kind of some of the points that were raised earlier around, um, you know, we need more government um, kind of overseeing this. Uh, again, going back to Russ's point about making sure that there's improvements in our procedures around the testing of these products. Um, and also giving some thought to, uh, uh, as one of the questions in the audience, um, to, the, to their point, vulnerable populations. So there may be groups that, for a variety of reasons, have higher exposure levels. What um, might we be able to put in place to really protect those populations as well? Absolutely. Mika? So I think the, my policy solution mm -hmm. would be, for at least one of them would be for the EPA to strengthen its oversight by giving uh, sufficient weight to um, evidence of endocrine disrupting potential in uh, toxicology, toxicological tests of these chemicals. Um, and I think Tamara just mentioned it as well, giving sufficient weight is important um, because endocrine disruption is important, but also modifying tests so that we're not just looking at high doses and high dose um, uh, exposures because for endocrine disruptors as we all have mentioned before low doses really really matter as well and the way the toxicology is done for a lot of these um, tests right now they're only looking at high doses thank you and pete can you round us out yeah i would look for a package of policies that move us into a world in which moms don't have to be chemical engineers to go shopping for their kids very important yes um this concludes today's panel. Uh, thank you all so much for coming and thank you all for your uh, great questions. As you all know, the panel was on the health implications of hormone altering chemicals. Thank you so much for joining us. We also encourage you to continue the conversation on the forum website at forumhsph.org and to watch the upcoming forum on the 21st Century Cures Act. That'll be presented jointly with STAT and it will be February 27th at 12.30 p.m. Thank you. If you are interested in supporting this program and others like this from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, please call 617-432-1318 for further information.